Good evening. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Welcome back to Edible Education 101. I'm Will Rosenzweig. Uh, this is a unique class here at UC Berkeley, mixing together undergraduates and graduates from all across the campus. And um, it's one of the courses here that we take a lot of pride in. It's rather unique. And it's unique in many ways. It's, it's unique in the sense that you get to learn all about your role in the food system and how the food movement is, is uh, evolving. And um, you get to hear from some of the people that are really shaping this movement and that have been leading it for many years. And uh, tonight we have a very exciting and special guest, David Mas Masumoto, who will be joining us shortly. This is your teaching team. This is our contact information. Could, the, could Rohini, our GSI, raise her hand? There she is, just so you put a face with an email address. And then where are our readers, Brian, Ryan, and Michaela? OK. So they're the people that are helping you behind the scenes, answering your questions, and grading your papers. OK? Um, for those of you that were kind enough to tell me that we needed to give grades in this class, thank you very much. Uh, when we inherited this course, it had been a pass, no pass course. But now that it's hosted here at the Haas School of Business, it actually is available for letter grades. So I noticed that about half of you have signed up for letter grades. And the requirements will remain the same. Um, but the uh, grading will just be a little bit different. Is that OK with everybody now? There was a little bit of confusion, particularly on my part last week. Yes? Is it on the Haas curve? <laughs> That's a really good question. It won't be on the Haas curve, I believe. But I'll, I will find out for sure. Okay. I need to find out. I thought I would just share with you the course objectives again, for those of you that weren't here last week, what you're really trying to get out of this course. Yes? Um, for some hospitals, this is your opportunity to have Right. Correct. Now, I think if you're a Haas student, you have to take I think if you're a Haas undergraduate, you have to take it for a letter grade. OK? So the course objectives, just to reiterate these to you. I was supposed to cover them. We really wanted you to come away from this semester <laughs> understanding how the food do. system this works and how it's structured. <laughs> we want to help you understand your own personal role in the food system and how your choices and actions are linked to the impacts of the food system. <laughs> we want to help you clarify your own personal values. Oh and understand how thought. they relate to the food system and the food movement. The food movement is effectively where you'd like to move the food system from where it is today. We want to help you kind of develop the skills of reflecting and then turning reflection into action. Hmm. We want this course to help you get activated and empowered to um, make change. We want you to develop what I like to call food systems intelligence. It's kind of a skeptical mindset. It's a mindset that can peer through noise and confusion. And as Alice mentioned last week, terminology and dishonesty to really understand the truth and then understand how that truth relates to your own values. Um, and then we want to help you develop a plan of action and also to get a sense to think about how your own educational experience might translate or manifest in participating either professionally or in some capacity in the $7 trillion food system. Okay? So this is our um, opportunity now to take attendance. So for those of you that are taking this course for a grade, by the way, I should have mentioned on the grading, um, you get one point for turning in your question on time. You get a half a point for turning it in late, but before the class starts. 
you get zero points for turning it in after the class starts. Okay? So many of you got a, a point. And then of all the questions that we get, we have 217 students registered for the class. Every week, the readers select three questions each. And then of those nine questions, I pick three or four to try to weave into the conversation with our guest. And we will acknowledge you for your um, contribution of a question. And if your question was one of those nine selected, we're going to put you in a drawing for a lunch or dinner at Chez Panisse. OK? Oh, now you're inspired and motivated. To write good questions. Yeah. All right. OK, so here's, to, here's today's attendance question. Which of the following terms is not which of the following terms is not a fast food value per Alice Waters lecture last week? A, uniformity, B, speed, C, transparency, D, cheapness, E, terminology. Go ahead and put in your answer. How did we do? We'll give you about 20 more seconds. You want to switch and show this? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. No. There you go. 88% got the right answer. Well done. Thank you. We have a little over 160 of our 217 registered today. All right. And you know that each week you get some readings, and the readings are often recommended by me or our guests. And this week you have the great um, privilege of reading somebody writing who really knows how to write. And, um, Mas Masumoto has been a great inspiration to me. He's really kind of a lyric poet farmer, and uh, his writing is very evocative and personal, and uh, I hope he will read something to us tonight. So last week we talked about values. Alice talked a lot about fast food values, and when I first heard her give that lecture, I thought she was really just talking about food and fast food. But the more I reflected on it, the more I realized, no, she's talking about our culture. She's talking about culture broadly. And last week, she talked to us about her fast food values, and she showcased the um, notions of uniformity, of speed, and you know, with speed comes multitasking, and with multitasking comes fragmented attention and lack of concentration. With lack of concentration comes expectations for instant gratification and a whole plethora of other maladies. She also talked about this ubiquity of availability that we come to expect. Everything should be available everywhere, anytime, anywhere we need it. And through this, we tend to start diminishing the appreciation of the uniqueness of things. There's a wonderful uh, Japanese term called wabi-sabi. Does anybody know what wabi-sabi means? Wabi-sabi means the perfection in imperfection. And it's a, a quality that Japanese potters would give to their handmade vessels when they would make, say, tea bowls. And they would look and find what was imperfect about it, and it was that imperfection that they would honor because it wasn't uniform like everything else. She talked about cheapness. She talked about how difficult it is in our country given some of the ways our farm bill is structured and subsidies come into the farming equation. 
that it's very hard to understand what the true cost of food is, and we'll get a first-hand account from the farming perspective today. She also talked about dishonesty and terminology. This was an illustration of what goes for cage-free eggs. This is what cage-free eggs look like. And of course, more is better. So these are fast food values. And now I hope all of you have a index card. Everybody have an index card? If you need one, raise your hand. We'll fly it up to you. What I'd like you to do is take out your pen, just reflect for a minute, take a second and write down three to five values that you hold dear, that you cherish, that you would protect and preserve and act on behalf of. What are three to five values that you care about? Values are what do we care about deeply? Take just a few more seconds for this. If you need more time to reflect on this, that's perfectly okay. Now I want you to flip the card over. Just take a second. I want you to think about what fast food value may have you unwittingly adopted or practiced. What's a fast food value that maybe has creeped into your own life? Maybe you're not proud of, but maybe it's not necessarily a value you think you hold, but it might be one you're actually practicing. Can you think of something that's a fast food value that you that has creeped into your life? All right, let's start with the fast food values. Who's got a fast food value they want to share that they, don't be shy. Yes? Uniformity. Say uniformity in what way? How has that creeped into your life? Okay, so being really strict about your routine. Okay, who else? Yeah. Mechanization, okay. Who else has got something a little different? Yeah. Okay, more is better thinking you need to be productive all the time or overly productive. Yeah. Yeah, you, efficiency? Well, wow, we got a lot of type A people in this room, don't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very impatient. Okay, good. All right, now flip it over and give me some examples of values that you cherish. Who's got one they want to share? Anybody? Yeah. Integrity. What does that mean to you? So integrity, doing what you say you're going to do is a good definition. Bringing good intention, that's, that's good. Yeah? Health. health. The value of health. Being, being conscious of what I'm putting in my body, taking care of my body. Okay, great. Did everybody hear that? Health, taking care of oneself, one's body, what they put in their body. Yes, up there in the teal. Say, say that again. Cruelty free, so living your edi own edible life in a way that you are fr 
free of cruelty, less, less harm. Okay, so being mindful of that. Yeah, good. Anybody else? One more. Yeah. Self-criticism. Say more. Okay. All right. Yeah, reflection. Reflection is a value, meaning I'm going to look back on what I did and become more aware of what I'm doing. This is a big step in edible education, honestly, is this process of reflection. Sometimes if you're overly mechanized or scheduled or rigorously productive, are you putting in the appropriate time to kind of reflect on what you're doing. So the reason we wanted to give you a card was so that you might hold this kind of separate from all your other stuff and reflect on it during the week and maybe refine it. You know, what we'd really like is for you as the course progresses to refine these values and almost be able to come up with your own statement of core values and particularly those core values that impact the way you eat and participate in the food system. So think about that. We're planting a seed for one of your future papers. So, you know, Alice, last week, I was looking at this picture. Remember that? How many of you participated in the farmer's market last week and went home with a bunch of vegetables? Yeah, how many? A lot of people. It's quite amazing. Alice brought several tables of produce and um, it made me think that there were several values that are part of the food movement that she didn't articulate explicitly, one really being generosity. She was very generous. She's a generous person to come teach, to give away the food. She often says to me, we have to win them over, and she wins people over through generosity. It's a very important value in the food movement. Another value that I think kind of went unsaid, but actually demonstrated, is this notion of gratitude. Being thankful for the opportunities we have, being thankful for the food that was with us, being thankful for the guests that we have, what have you. But the practice of gratitude certainly is something that can be part of a reflective um, process to you know, develop more awareness, again, about your own role in the food system. So tonight I wanted to introduce a couple more themes for the course to think about. Disruption was a theme that was in the reading that, that Moss suggested. And we're in a very interesting time right now, of kind of massive disruption and upheaval. People use this word in many different ways. Some people come to UC Berkeley to learn how to disrupt an industry or a category or a business, how to change the, the way of, a, of an incumbent. In Moss's article, we learned that the tractor um, disrupted the horse. And then I learned in another class this last week that a lot of the self-driving autonomous ve vehicle technology, which we're all hearing about now from Uber, has actually been around for years at a little company called John Deere that has tractors. So it turns out the autonomous intelligence for vehicles started on the farm. Now disruption also leads to displacement. Whenever there's a disruption, there's generally a displacement. And that displacement can be very painful for those that are displaced. And we're experiencing a lot of that right now in our country where there's kind of a prevailing mentality now of winners and losers. So I want us to become aware that disruption may be good, but it also creates displacement. And those who are disrupting, do they bear any responsibility for the displacement? It's an interesting question. Or perhaps, um, in this displacement, they're not thinking about, or the, in the disruption, they're not thinking or even aware of the displacement. Okay, and I see this very interesting. It's going to tie in with next week's lecture and the, the next lecture when we talk about labor. And we're talking, going to talk about robots and um, 
the changing labor characteristics around the world as it relates to food. Two other concepts to share with you. Scale. You're going to hear a lot of competing visions of how the food movement and the food system should work. Right now, it pretty much works at a global, multinational scale. Uh, the stories you'll hear about tonight are of a small portion of the food system. But there's also a tension with scale about the soul of the enterprise. Now, another value that you heard about um, a lot last week from Alice, and that sort of permeates everything we're talking about is this notion of a biological system where everything is interconnected. And tonight we're going to talk about farming as it relates to the interconnections between soil and water and air and nutrition and human health and climate health and economic health, cultural health. And our guest tonight really was thinking there's probably nobody that knows more about ripeness than David Moss Masamoto. And Moss, I met, I was thinking back, I think it was in 2000 or 2001, and um, was at an event that I helped organize, and he brought two or three of his beautiful fruit trees to give away as gifts to participants at this gathering that was really all about land use. And he read from his book, and I was really touched. For those of you that have read his biography, you know that he's a UC Berkeley graduate. It's very important. We're honoring them. Long, long time ago. Long, long time ago. <laughs> he happens to have a daughter who's a UC Berkeley graduate, not that long ago, who's now part of the family business. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. And um, he really is a remarkable, award-winning author and um, really grows the world's greatest peaches. So without further ado, please welcome David Moss Masamoto. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I feel bad that I didn't bring a whole table full of peaches to share with you. Of course, if I did, it meant they probably came from Chile and not my farm. So anyway, uh, but it's a pleasure to hear it's, uh, Will's introduction and also some of the stories. So I'm going to begin with a short passage from a, a book that I wrote with my daughter called Changing Season, A Father, A Daughter, A Family Farm. On our farm, we grow something of value while keeping and sharing our values. Our life is built around a network of relationships and on sharing the meaning of emptiness, like feeling the feeling in the stillness of a summer morning just before the rush of harvest or in the uh, solitude of standing on a farmhouse porch in the middle of the night alone. And I bring that up to sort of contrast some of these dynamics of looking at farms, especially through different lenses. It was interesting, Will talked about wabi-sabi, and it's a type of Japanese term that I grew into and, and actually use on my farm. Roughly, it translates into life is impermanent, nature is imperfect, and our work is incomplete. And I think that's very appropriate given today's dynamic, especially with a lot of the political disruption that's occurring now. Tonight I want to talk about ecosystems. And usually you think of ecosystems in terms of uh, biological systems, where you look at biology of life on a farm, which includes plant, bacteria, soils, with microorganisms, and how they all work together and are interconnected with each other. It's a system that works as one in many ways. But tonight I want to expand that vision to look at life on a farm, not only what's grown, and on our farm it's organic peaches, nectarines, and raisins, but the ecosystem on a farm that's about the farm and the farmer, about those who work the farm, which necessarily includes farm workers, and all of those who are part of a food system, which includes the truckers, the brokers, the marketers, the restaurateurs, and ultimately all of you in this room who eat. It's all part of this ecosystem of, a, of an operation of a business. And again, it's looking at food not as a commodity, 
but something that carries life within it. It involves social, cultural, and economic capital. It embodies life for me through stories. And these stories, I think, capture that essence of the meaning of an ecosystem. It's about shared values that you could find in a story. And again, what I like about stories is that it goes beyond a commodity-based per, uh, perspective. You don't attach an economic value to a story. It's something that grows on you. And I'll read one passage from one of my earlier books that I think captures that power of story that will, in, uh, that will symbolize and manifest the work that I do on our farm. Suncrest is one of the last remaining truly peaches when you wash that treasure under a stream of cooling water, your fingertips instinctively search for that gushy side of the fruit. Your mouth waters in anticipation. You lean over the sink to make sure you don't drip on yourself. Then you sink your teeth into the flesh, and the juice trickles down your cheeks and dangles on your chin. This is a real bite a primal act, a magical sensory celebration announcing summer has arrived. That's the kind of peach that I grow. And that's how hopefully people will enjoy our peaches. Again, not as a commodity, but as something that has a different type of value. And at the center of our farm that I hope was captured in that paragraph was this notion of the value of human and social capital. Again, an ecosystem that's not just the biological life on the farm, it's also the human and culture and social, social life on the farm. And it's interesting because and I'm trying to put humans back into the food system. Because the last hundred years with the rise of industrialization, it's been a depersonalization of farmers off the land a constant trend line to push humans off the farm as technology and, uh, um, and mechanization took over. So we're going to start with a quiz. And the first question, if uh, they could bring it up, is, and it talks about this depersonalization that's occurring on the farm. So you could get your clickers out and get ready for this. So the first question, in 1900, farm jobs were approximately what percent of US jobs? This is 1900. A, 58%, B, 38%, or C, 22%. 1900. Okay, are we ready? Did you finish with your guessing? Okay. And the results are? Nineteen hundred. Oh, the answer. Most of them gave A. The correct answer is B. Thirty-eight percent. You were right if you were about twenty years into the eighteen eighties. In the eighteen eighties is when the majority of Americans still lived and worked on farms in America. And what happened precisely in America right around that time was the growth of the Industrial Revolution. Okay, uh, And at that point, there was this shift that occurred on the farm. All right, question number two. On the today, farm jobs are what percent of U.S. jobs? A, 20.4, B, 10.8, or C, 2.6? Register your answers. And the winner gets a peach from our farm. No, I'm kidding. All right, All right. are we ready? Okay, and the results are, most people said C. Well, who answered D? That's interesting. <laughs> we have some outliers in here in the audience. And that's true disruptors, I get. The correct answer is 2.6. All right, so again, think of that collapse of an industry. And if you think about farming, that was the majority of Americans in 1880 lived and farmed. By 1900, it was 38%, and look at the trend lines where it collapsed down to 2%. Actually, 2% 2 hit around 1980, and then it flattened out. Why? Because you still need some humans on the farm. It possibly won't go much lower than 2.6%, at least as long as I'm alive. 
But if you read the article about horses and tractors, it's the same trend lines that collapsed about that. It's interesting, though. When you look at those changes, you have to realize, where did all that displaced people go? Were they kicked off the farm and starving in the streets? No, they were absorbed by what? They were absorbed by industrial America, taking all those jobs. And people weren't kicked off the farm. They were happy to leave the farm. It was a hard physical work, an isolated work. They could work from a regular job Monday through Friday. They had weekends off. It gave rise to a leisure industry because you had evenings off. It, there was a whole shift that occurred to that. So it was a disruption on the farm. But for millions, it was a happy disruption. Unlike horses, when they were displaced off the farm, where did they go? They didn't go retire to the suburbs and have weekends off. So when you look at some of this, again, think of this idea of an ecosystem that's occurring and a massive change within the last 100 to 150 years when the majority of us were farmers. If you go back into most of your family lines, two to three generations before, they were farming. There are some pockets that long ago when they immigrated from other countries left that uh, uh, lifestyle behind. But most of us have farm blood in our lineage. Most of us won't claim that very proudly, but that's OK, too. You know. Again, when there was this shift in agriculture, what happened? It was a mechanization of certain commodities. And they were mainly the big grains, corn, wheat, soybeans. That was natu a natural progression in that. You could see tractors taking over those fields that were harvested by hand. My father grew, grew cotton at one time on our farm and hand-picked it. And that was only about maybe 60 to 70 years ago. So that displacement wasn't always that rapid. But as Will talked about, part of that displacement occurred where now you have driverless tractors. Right? They use GPS, uh, um, uh, GPS systems, so the, far, the tractor drives itself. One of the dynamics is you have big farm equipment and big open land. We cannot have tractors and uh, driverless tractors on our farm because none of my rows are straight. Right? You have to have straight rows. You have to have areas where you could turn the equipment because they're massive sizes. It's that shift that occurred in certain areas of agriculture. But produce was one that stayed very, very labor intensive with, with many hands still on the farm. It's ironic because now there's lots of food safety concerns, of course. And there's a definition that they often use for creating sterile environments. And one of the challenges that I have in terms of looking at this one force that's wanting to have safe food, and on the other hand, is what is safe food? Is safe food then food that's grown and processed by machines and technology? as if it's framing hands as being dirty, and technology and ma machines as being clean. So we are already probably falling into this trap of definitions, as Alice talked about last week. Because right? most of you will probably automatically think, that's right, hands could have bacteria, where machines are clean. Quickly behind that will become one is good and one is bad. And of course, some. Uh, uh, health professionals are saying that's exactly the opposite. We need bacteria in us. We need that kind of lively uh, microorganisms all around us because the most unhealthy populations will be those of you who grew up with antibiotics. The pink stuff. You remember that when you were a kid? All right. Uh, In the readings that you did, there was a chapter, a section I wrote about ghosts in the fields. And how about those ghosts are part of our life and part of what we do. And I'll read a, a portion of that that was uh, framed in the um, at readings that you did. And this is from another book I wrote called Letters to the Valley. And it was written as a, as a series of letters, and this one was to my father. Dear Dad, I work with the ghosts of farm workers. They haunt me, mostly in winter, when the tule fog hugs the earth for days. 
I trudged to the, through the fields, forcing myself to venture into wet, bone-chilling cold, listening to the moisture drip from the peach trees and grapevines. That's when the ghosts greet me, a shadow in the gray mist, something familiar in the desert, moving methodically among the grapevines, a fellow worker lost in the silhouette glare of winters. I work with ghosts in my fields. And the reason why I know that is we have 100-year-old vines in front of our house that were obviously pruned 100 times through 100 winters. The scars of those pruners helped shape those vines. I know that from a different context, of course. When I was a kid, a high school kid, my dad wanted me to prune some trees. He taught me how to prune, and I massacred those trees. Now, years later, I regret that because I have to live with that impatient high schooler who wanted to go to the football game, who wanted to go to do what I did in high school. Uh, and I live with the scars of that on the trees. And I bring that up today because it has the idea of we think of often of food in a very narrow context of today. But all food has history with it. On our farm, it's the history of the farmer who owned the land before us and the farmer before that. It's the history of my grandparents, immigrants from Japan, working these fields as farm workers. And my parents working these same fields, and I have now inherited that. It's the history that has some dark sides, too. When my grandparents immigrated, they could not own land in California because there are alien land laws specifically barring Orientals from buying land in California. And a number of Western states had similar laws. Sounds familiar to today, doesn't it? Barring certain immigrants because they were different. Right? That's the history that's part of our farm. And of course, part of our farm had to do with Japanese Americans being interned during World War II. And this is the 75th anniversary of that. And they were interned because they looked like the enemy. And my parents and grandparents were imprisoned in the Arizona desert behind Bob Bar for four years. That history is part of our farm. Why? Part of it was my parents came back to our area to farm. We did not own farmland before the war, but they returned. So part of that legacy of that history is buried literally in the soil that we have. So what does it mean today? Of course, we have some new politics and new, a new president. You hear a lot of demonization of immigrants, the talk of deportation and exclusion. And yet, these are some of the same people who harvest the food that we eat today. So are we talking about a class of people who live in the shadows? that live with that bias and racism, and how does that fit our food ecosystem? Because they're often invisible. They're part of the hands that you don't see that touch our food. So that's another, again, looking at the farming and food through a different lens. And it's not just farmers. It's in the back of the house of restaurants people that are working that you don't see behind the food that you eat in restaurants, too. It's all part of that history that gets woven into that ecosystem of all farms that we have. Now, on our farm, we have something very unique. We have a long timeline. Why? Because my daughter is taking over the farm. It has changed the way I look at the fields, because I would look at how many harvests do I have left? I just turned 63. So at 63, how many more harvests of peaches are in me? 10? 20? So there's a, there's a finite horizon. But with our daughter taking it over, we can plant a new orchard knowing that it will mature and she will see it for decades after that. It changes the timelines, because we don't think of food often in terms of these different timelines. So we think of the immediate with that. You know, again, we'll describe my daughter. She went to Berkeley here, right? And she majored in the perfect major that took her back to the farm. She was a women and gender study major here. 
and she loved it. And in many ways, she was a young woman now entering this male-dominated profession, but she's also very progressive. She's queer, she's outspoken, she's part of this changing world of agriculture, part of that new ecosystem that's evolving. So her is, she challenges that old definition, part of that disruption that Will talked about. But she also gets a lot of pushback at the same time. That's why majoring in women and gender studies possibly was the exact right major for her to form. Right, because it's, it's a different perspective. <laughs> My daughter would love that. <laughs> uh, so when we think in terms of the food ecosystem, how does that element of time and generations play into fast food? How does it play into the foods that we eat? Right? Uh, so let me now give you a flavor of our farm and our daughter, and we're going to play a trailer from a PBS documentary that was nationally broadcast this past May of last year. And it talks about, oh, that's, it's the other one, Will. Uh, it's, it talks about uh, our farm, and this is just a trailer to the documentary. Okay, Will? How many harvests do you have in you? I think you choose to be a farmer, and I think it's partly because if you try to make it as a rational decision, it doesn't make sense. You know, you put in hours and hours of your labor, uncertain about the economic return on it. It's physical. It breaks down your body, and as I'm getting older, I'm, I'm very aware of that. And the Kiko came back home and said she wanted to farm. And it suddenly changed the timeline of our farm. Instead of me thinking, how many harvests do I have, it's how many harvests do we have. If you start thinking of these trees, I'm amazed that this has another whole round that we could pick on. My decision to come back to the Central Valley and live being queer, being mixed race, being progressive. I came home with no illusion that it would be easy. Is that good enough to Yeah. I still see all the branches as potential fruit and get overwhelmed by the possibilities. Yeah, there might be tons of fruit on it. I'm here and I'm making my way, but the big climbing is yet to come. Yeah, see? It's a little better. See how it's separated much yeah. more? And now you have this nice group here, nice group. There's a part of me that says, am I making a mistake by having her follow in these footsteps? What is the destiny for this life? Do you want to pass that on to your child? And at the same time, the joy of having your own child follow in your footsteps. All right? I have found a home for myself here, both on the farm as a peaceful place for me to be free with the trees as my best friends and my family who are amazing human beings. <laughs> the big picture is resilience, right? The big picture is to continue to do this, to save the family farm for another generation, to keep feeding people. Go Beach! <laughs> That's this renewal that I get from the community of people we have gotten to share our harvests with. Thank you. That documentary, our hope was it would capture that transition of a farm from one generation to another, expand that, that timeline. Embedded in that isn't necessarily a smooth transition. You know, and certainly my wife here tonight will tell you about why it hasn't always been smooth at different times. It's part of this notion of disruption. You would think 
this is great to have another generation come to the farm. It's also very disruptive. Can you imagine working the rest of your life with one of your parents? <laughs> Talk about disruption, right? right? So that's embedded in this timeline. Because just like as you met, read that article about horses and tractors, it wasn't smooth, especially if you were a horse. Right? So there's this embedded in this notion of progression and change, the notion of disruption and stability at the same time. But, and the core function, I think, of looking at an ecosystem is understanding that transparency that's occurring through time and, in, and exactly looking at the different flashpoints of change and disruption. When it's working right, I think you'll see the context of food, especially through a story. I could talk about generations shifting on farms. Putting a face with it, I think, adds that element of a story. It creates a character, as a good story does. And you can see the trends that are developed in a picture from the past to the present to the future. And what happens on the farm when you look at that context of food in this broader perspective. One of the results that has occurred through this change on the farm has been, and, I would, and Alice talked about it, this cheap food policy, a commodification of foods, where the goal of farming was to drive down prices. So here's the quiz. Right? Question number three. In 1930s, get your clickers out, approximately what percent of income was spent on food in the US in 1930? Was it A, 50% of a household income was spent on food, B, 35%, or C, 25%? 1930. Okay. Locked in. And the results? Watch someone chose D. Okay. So, oh, it's fairly split between A, 45%, Oh, excuse me, 45% uh, uh, chose A, which was 50% of the food, or B, 35%. The correct answer is C, 25%. All right? And it's, it's, again, you think most of us, but think about it. If you spent 50% of your money on food, you also have to pay for the other main component of your life, which would be shelter. What else does that leave you with? All right, this was the beginning of the Great Depression. You're right, it was a collapse of the economy, but the U.S. was never truly that poor of a country in the 1900s. In 1930, Thailand spent 54% of their income on food. To give you a context of it. All right, now, question number four. Last quicker question. Today, what percent of income is spent on food in the U.S.? Is it A, 20%? B, 9.4% or C, 5.3%? Answer is locked in. This will determine your grade in this class, right? You know that. All right, we have the results. Results. Majority of you chose B, 9.4%, followed closely by C. 5.3. The correct answer is 9.4%. B. Congratulations. All right. Now, stop and think about that. In the height of the Depression, when people, a majority of one in four were, didn't have a job, one in five were unemployed in the Depression, we spent 25%. And here, now, today, with a much more robust economy, we're still spending 9.4%. Is that high or low? Right. It's hard to say because most people would want these prices to continue to drop down because isn't that the goal of capitalism, right? To get you know, more efficiencies and more productivity to drop prices. It's interesting though, I'm not so sure it could drop much lower than 9%. I certainly don't want it to drop lower because it would mean less hands on the farm. It would be moving to a very sterile, mechanized, food system. But you also need to compare different things. Today, in today's world, the same question for Nigeria. 
56% is spent of food on food in Nigeria. The Philippines, 42%. And I never thought of the Philippines as that uh, poor of a nation. But same question, and when you, but if you look at it, 20% of the poorest households in America today are spending between 30 to 40% on food. Even though as a nation we're spending 10%, 9.6, all right? The top 20% of the wealthiest households in America spend about 6% on food. Right? So if you were poor in America, you are still spending a large amount of your income on food. So even though prices have dropped, if you are still poor, you're still spending a, a, about uh, a fourth of your income on food. So that means if you start working, low-income people tend to have, uh, they struggle in poverty, a minimum wage. That meant if, minimum, if we're paying $10 an hour, $250 of every hour that you spent of money is going just to food. We're not counting shelter, we're not counting transportation, we're not counting health care, we're not counting education, and certainly not counting any kind of entertainment with it. So there's this, this dynamic of even though we have a cheap food policy, it ain't cheap for everybody. So there's part of this uh, di uh, dichotomy, this conflict that we have. So one of the dynamics of an ecosystem, we're talking about the ecosystem of a farm that includes farmers, farm workers, consumers, it includes shippers and truckers. What, how do we measure the health of this ecosystem? Is it dollars spent on food? If the farmer, there's this drive to push prices lower, and it's killing me. It's, the, it's what my daughter will be inheriting, that type of drive for productivity and efficiency while we're trying to create this other value in food at the same time. What's missing in our ecosystem is this other abstract idea called joy. Food is supposed to be nice. You enjoy it. Right? That's why we have this diverse diet. Nutritionists, nutritionists would say we could probably eat a type of gruel and survive that has the basic food and vitamins in it. But we don't want that. We want this aesthetic element of it, which changes this whole dynamic of it. Part of that joy from, for a farmer, I think, is trying to look at different things in the work that we do and trying to put joy back into farming. Right? It's hard because you have these prices driving you down to 9.6% of food, of, of income spent on food, while at the same time trying to find joy in that. And it ain't joy in counting the money that we're making. Right? So where's the joy in farming? For me, it's trying to find a diff different aesthetics of things and trying to use a different lens, trying to use a different perspective when you look at the ecosystem and finding joy in the human element part of the farming landscape. And I think that's why all of you are here tonight, too. You're looking for that other element of it. Otherwise, you'd be in an economic statistician or something like that. Here's how I find joy on our farm. All good farms have a junk pile. It stays with the land and the succession of owners who contribute to the collection of odd machine parts, old equipment, and discarded but never forgotten stories. Since I have a forklift, my first major contribution to the pile is to restack most of it on wooden pellets. I now have a portable junk pile. I can move stuff from place to place like a modern archaeologist using machinery during his rummage through, through history. I use the junk to fix things and glean new ideas and inspiration. When a sculptor friend and I probed through the pile, he was enthralled by the variety of odd shapes and angles. We pulled out a bright orange fork steel tooth from some kind of harvester, sat it upright and walked around it and made comments. He buried part of it in the dirt and called it modern art. I left it in place for a few months, then dug it out when I needed to cultivate that area, tossing it back onto the junk pile, calling it postmodern art. <laughs> in my junk, treasures lie hidden. Old pieces from equipment tell me the history of a farm. 
It's as if time is left behind in these relics, not as fossils or memorials to the past. The remains are to be used by future farmers. After I spoke at a farm conference in Wisconsin, an old farmer dressed in overalls approached me to talk to me about his junk pile. Out here, we don't call them junk piles, he announced, and I thought he was going to use the term bone pile, which is rarely used in California. Instead, he said, out here, we call them, and then he leaned closer, as if to whisper a secret, we call them inventory. It's redefining space. It's redefining elements on the farm. It's about looking at something that's everyday and normal through a different lens. That's the joy I find in our farm. And I think that's the joy you're going to find when you look at food through a different lens that you're learning. It's all part of a new movement that's sometimes called the experience economy. People more and more are looking for meaning, not things. It's an interaction that's personal, not an accumulation of more stuff. They spend time on living, they spend time living with elements that are shared often in social media. It's a new point of view. Products are consumed, but services are experienced. So my question is, are my peaches, can they be both a product and also an experience. This is part of that new shift, that new disruption that's occurring on our farm. It's part of that story, the power of story that I write about, the power of, that power of story that helps define food in our life today. I think I, I am realizing that I am just not a producer of stories, but I'm also a farmer that has peaches, and the backstory of what we do matters. And it only works in collaboration with others. Used to be, when I was a kid, you grew peaches, waved goodbye to them at the loading dock, and the only return that you have was how much they sold for. Okay? A shift occurred with the Internet of Things. We have to put stickers on our fruit. They have the PLU, the price lookup codes, written on them for the marketers. But now we put our website on that. I can actually hear from people. They could go to the website. They could learn about a documentary. They could see the faces behind their food. It's a new role of looking at an ecosystem of food where everybody are collaborators. I hope no one uses Yelp to critique and review our peaches. But it's a type of dynamic where consumers and customers are now part of the food system more than ever. And I want to demonstrate this whole idea of collaboration in an ecosystem using a very, very different perspective. And it's this video that I want to show you. And I want to demonstrate this in terms of music. And the video I'm going to show you is from uh, Carol King winning a national medal at the Kennedy Center. And Carol King was this wonderful woman musician and songwriter in the 60s and 70s. And this video is about her collaboration with this amazing singer called Aretha Franklin. So as you watch that video, I want you to think about how collaboration works. And pay attention to the joy in Carol's face when she collaborates with Aretha Franklin. There is only one Aretha Franklin.
this video and Carol King where she said this quote the remarkable feeling to hear a song of yours come back with all the embellishments and it's even better you could see the joy in Carol King's face when she as a songwriter was able to let go of her work give it to someone else who made it better that's the kind of collaboration I think that's in the potential of the new food system where you could have this collaboration of many parts and many people who make it better. It makes me think, I, are farmers singers or are we songwriters? I ask myself, am I like a songwriter where I create something and I am, let it go and trust others to make it better? I am allowing others to take ownership of it, be it a broker, be it a marketer, be it a restauranter, a chef, a cook, or you, when you buy some of our peaches, you make it better. And you bring out that life that you saw in that video, the life of an ecosystem when it's working at its best, because all the different parts are working in integrated whole to make it better. It means that I am more of an artist than a businessman, and I could seek new returns on investment. That video captured that soul of a song that money could never buy. That video captured the joy of Carol King willing to let go of her work. Most of us think of our entrepreneurs as those that hold on to their work and carry it from the beginning to end. The truth is, most entrepreneurs at one point are willing to let go of their work and let it advance. We tend not to celebrate them because how often do we reward the singer and not the, song, the songwriter? And that's what I hope people find in our peaches and nectarines on our farm when we all think of ourselves as collaborators into something more. We grow food. But it's more than food. It's a story. It's a spirit in life. And you, as students, are part of that contribution, too. We are all collaborators working at something to make it better. And we want to, and the hope is, all of you will understand that collective impact when all the pieces work together. And you can see that joy of a songwriter and the power of Aretha Franklin and her ability to take the work of someone else and put it together and honor that creator with her own creation at the same time. It's a joy, again, of collaboration. So here's my quest and challenge to you. What's your story with food? That's why you're here tonight. You are interested in food. Right? We're in the beginning of this odd era 
of belonging and unbelonging, part of the politics that are swirling around the landscape. And where do, for example, where do my peaches fit in this? But it all begins, I think, with a personal connection. And that's what I want to challenge you tonight. I want you to think about why you're interested in food. And what you're going to do is it wonderfully, Will has passed out your index cards. I want you to write in the next minute why you're interested in food. Another way to describe it is, how did you lose your food virginity? I want this to be personal. I don't want this definition. I want it to be personal. Where were you when your attitudes of food changed? Who was at the table? What were you eating? What were you doing? You may have been five, but you remember this one moment, food became something special. I want you to write about this right now. You have one minute to write your story of how you lost your food virginity. Right, 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 right. Make it personal. This is your story. Make it personal. Make it detailed. What were you eating? Who were you with? How did you feel? Good. Reveal something. Food reveals who you are. Very nice. You get a point. Good. All right, wrap up your story. Are you about wrapped up with the story? Put a conclusion on it. This was the moment food changed you. And I'm assuming this changed you because that's why you're in this class. Part of this new ecosystem of food is called shared values, right? Where this collaborative network of Carol King and Aretha Franklin is that they share each other's work. So now, I want you to share your work. Turn your card to someone next to you and they can read your food story. Go! Trades cards. Very good, very good. Now I can't get you quiet. All right, very good, thank you, thank you. The reason why I had you write this down is that it's now become a story. The power of stories is that it could be shared. I want you to take your card and your story and continue to share it. Right? Because if stories aren't shared, they are secrets. And the food ecosystem we want involves transparency, not secrets. That's the problem with a lot of our food system today. It revolves around secrets. The personal story you just wrote, and thank you for those of you who are willing to share it. 
and willing to be that transparent about it because this marks your change about how food affects you, hopefully the rest of your life, and it will be the rest of my life too because the stories you shared are exactly the story that's part of our farm. The way our peaches work when they're working the best is when someone bites into that, they're not tasting my peach, they're tasting the memory that they had of food and fruits and peaches. It becomes their story, not mine. That's the power of this ecosystem that we're trying, I'm hoping, that's evolving now. It's all part of that new food network that we're all linked in together in a very collaborative, collaborative way, and it's personal. And that's what's very unique about this. And it's partly because of new technologies like the internet. It can uh, carry that personal nature across states, across bounds, across farms to cities. I want to close with this dynamic of this sense of the group and sense of the whole, since I hope tonight we bonded. So I'm going to share this one passage in another book I wrote called Four Seasons. And it's about a tractor, but it involves a sound. And I want all of us to be part of the soundscape of this story. It involves a chant. And the chant is simply, um. So when I signal you, I want everyone to chant, um. Ready? Um. OK, good. OK, that's the signal. Ready? I own a Buddhist tractor. When it's running well, I can hear the of a finely tuned engine and the potential for great work. I believe in the past most farmers connected spiritual beliefs to farm sounds. But many of these spiritual farm sounds are lost in today's modern farming. I've never heard a folk song about planting, harvesting, or change of season in California. I have no chant to bless a new tractor or plow, although the Armenians in Fresno delightfully still have a blessing of the grapes. I cheat and go to their ceremony, hoping some of their good luck will rub off. But few farmers talk to their trees or vines anymore. Farming in California is just over 100 years old, and perhaps that's not enough time for folk cultures to adapt to changes. Today, we have little spiritual work. We mostly do business. But that's precisely why I want to hear a Buddhist chant from my tractor. Thank you very much for letting me share my story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We brought you some fruit. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. And it's in season, too. Here, 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 <laughs> my tree. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, stay uh -huh. home. So, um, where's me tool bot? Congratulations. You're in the lottery. <laughs> Here's me tools question for you, David mm. Moss. In the article assigned for our reading in the Fresno Bee from 2008, you point out the loss of the influence of the farm vote. Mm -hmm. While that may be true, the structure of our national legislature is such that smaller rural states have a say disproportionate to their population. The same is true in most states about their rural counties. Given that 80% of Americans live in urban areas, how do you think choices about resource usage, land and water rights, et cetera, should be made, keeping in mind that urban and rural interests don't always align, but are interdependent? What a complicated question. <laughs> uh, you're right, and the history of it, of course, is he talking about the House of Representatives, right, in, in American college, is set up by populations. Right? So the urban areas are going to have a disproportionate power in the House. But the Senate was required each state to have two senators. So Montana, I believe it is, has one person in the House of Representatives and two senators. 
disproportionate power in that. And it was the idea that when America was founded, there would be this balance between urban and rural. It was a struggle that's not talked about in Hamilton much, between Hamilton, who wanted urban power, and uh, uh, Jefferson, who wanted rural America to have power. So it's embedded in the system. All right? So you're absolutely right about that. The shift that's occurring, though, in that, and it, it's beginning to show itself in today's politics. Right? You're having this tension that's tearing. If you look at some of the voting patterns of Trump's victory, he won in the rural areas of key states, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. That's what pushed and carried him over at one point. So you could say, wow, rural, rural America still has power in it. And yet, at the same time, there's been this wild dynamic where, for example, without getting too political, Trump has wanting to renegotiate all these trade deals, especially with exporting products. Most of those exports come from these rural America. Example, if you look at California, the growth in the almond industry has been vast and huge, and the biggest market for uh, almonds is China. So there's going to be this massive disruption that's occurring. And it's interesting because there is this tension that's occurring. What happens with this rural vote, which is still fairly small, you saw the statistics, the uh, percent of the labor force is so very small in rural America. And yet they still have some clout and some power. It's this combination of what I like to consider the contradictions that are in our political system. For example, the farm bill, right, which sets a lot of standards and prices for the commodities, corn, wheat, soybeans. Part of the farm bill is the food school lunch, uh, a food stamp program. And what do food stamps have to do with the farm bill? It was the only way when the f uh, food stamp program was initiated that they could get enough votes in the Senate. So they combined the two together. So you have two different things dealing with mainly urban poor with food stamps and the farm bill. And they're both in the same legislation. The premise was urban people and urban representatives would talk with the rural folks to get this legislation passed. There's going to be, I think, this wild time we're in for these alliances are being shattered and new ones are going to be come together. That's where potentially I do think this new collaborative nature might evolve into something just amazing. That's the optimistic side of a farmer. You are a pathological optimist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sick. So, and, and an optimist, though, depends somewhat on some predictability or some certainty. You expect, even when there's a drought, that there's going to be some rain to fall on your farm. You expect that the sun's going to come up tomorrow. How do you think about navigating now in an environment that overnight seems perhaps more uncertain? Uh, a lot of uh, mental stress. <laughs> A lot of times when I get, to be very frank, I get depressed because there's so many things out of my control. Realize, I go out, our family goes out, we prune trees, we take care of them, we grow them, we pick the fruit, we ship them to market, and we don't know the damn price. We do all this before we get the price. That's the nature of a lot of farming. Right? So there's this optimis optimism that's built into this, this kind of trust, this notion of this crazy system. Because how can you grow something when you don't even know what you're going to sell it for? It's what food systems have always been. And the only other answer would, would be to find a way to commodify it. And that's what the commodities have done, of course, where you could have future pork bellies, you know, futures, uh, the futures market in wheat and corn and soybean where they tried to do that, and it's driven the whole industry to this very rigid business economic model where the only return on investment is measured in profits. And let's talk a little bit about being a farmer today. Say I want to be an on say I'm going to graduate from UC Berkeley mm -hmm. in a couple of years mm -hmm. with a bachelor's in history. Mm -hmm. I don't have a grandfather that had a farm but I've noticed the growth of farmers' markets has just been off the charts. I noticed that there's an edible schoolyard project in my 
town and I want to move out of California, what do I do? Where do I go? What's, what's your sage advice for somebody that wants to get into the livelihood of farming? And then what does that look like? What, what are the mm -hmm. economics of that? Can you make a living? Is there a livelihood? Mm -hmm. uh, the quick answer is uh, you're going to be poor, monetarily wise you will not make much money. Right? There was an old adage when I was growing up, farmers are land rich but cash poor. Okay? You're not going to be wealthy. So just if you plan to be, don't go into farming. Don't get, don't get involved with the food industry. You know? uh, the main thing, my suggestion is just go and start doing it. You know, start working at a farmer's market. Start getting your hands dirty. Start gardening. You know, you're not going to buy land, probably. In fact, the new model may be non-land ownership. All right? And maybe there's this new share economy that's going to evolve. Maybe there's this new gig economy that's going to evolve. It's going to be very disruptive in that sense. You know? So that's a big barrier. But I'm not so sure there aren't new opportunities that are going to occur. You have to be optimistic. And you have to be willing to work your ass off. All right? there, I remember growing up, a farmer said, you know, my parents, who were immigrants, um, uh, they wanted me to work really hard. They wanted me to work so hard, he swore his parents planted weeds to make sure he had, <laughs> had enough work to do. <laughs> so if you're going to go into this world of food, right, plan on not being rich, plan on uh, a, a life of struggle, plan on a lot of hard work, but look for those moments of joy, because that's your return on investment on that. Fantastic. Where's Atisha Lewis Baptiste? Is she here? Where? This is um, Atisha's question. Mm. Much of the argument Mr. Masumoto makes in working with ghosts in the field of American agriculture is centered around how we use language to frame the immigration debate. Given how divisive and inflammatory this, this debate has become since he wrote this piece, would Mr. Masumoto still suggest that appropriate labels are what is most needed? Finally, what words would he use to name the nameless? Mm, very good question. Uh, one, of the, one of the challenges is how can you put faces on people who don't want to be seen? Because they're often undocumented. And it's a challenge. But that's where the role of everyone in this room are part of that collaborative nature of farming. Right? To understand there are these faces, faceless workers out there. There's been some great, ironically, artwork done capturing workers with their faces hidden. Because that's the nature of this food world that we're in. We're in. in terms of using the different terminology, uh, you could start seeing it being spun Every day you look at politics today and terms are being used, whether it's uh, you know, uh, alternate facts and different <laughs> dynamics of instead of lies, you call it alternate facts. Uh, uh, so there is this new dynamic of language that's being unfolded. It's the language of social media at the same time because it spreads so quickly. You know, I, I, I write for a newspaper, and the interesting dynamic of newspapers used to occupy this, this position as being gatekeepers of news. And that's been all blown up with social media. The dynamic, though, is everyone in this room has the power to start controlling some of that language of how you use language. Because it's when you tweet, it's when you uh, uh, post things on Facebook or whatever, that gets spread. You know, so there's this undercurrent of a lot of shift that's occurring. And, and I'm not sure how that's going to uh, turn out. I know when uh, I wrote Epitaph for a Peach, which is in 95, it was published. It was just when a lot of food w world was starting to explode and celebrity chefs were making the scene. And farmers were not recognized right, at that point. It was just the beginning. Alice was one of the first ones you know, to help promote the work that farmers did. Now farmers are much more visible in many ways. You know? uh, so one of the dynamics is what caused that shift? And it was really individuals championing someone else. Alice championed faceless farmers. You know, it's the celebrity chefs that I like 
uh, that actually acknowledge where the food comes from. Because I've met chefs from both extremes. Some that are wonderful, that, that uh, honor the work that I do, and others that could give, that couldn't care at all the work that I did, right? Because they are so egotistical that they think they could fix and do anything with our food. So you have those, but is that any different than it's always been? So there's that kind of dynamic in terms of looking at that, of, of labeling, and people's ability to champion something. Thank you for that wonderful question. Thank you. Who's got a question from the uh, house tonight? One or two more? Anyone? For Moss? Don't be shy. Yeah. Say your name and say it loud. <laughs> Hi, uh, Jason. Hey, Jason. Uh, Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of historical oppression that was part of the farm workforce. Um, and still, um, there is different forms of that kind of slavery uh, through prison labor uh, today in the South. Um, so my curiosity for you is, do you see technology as being empowered in mm. its role um, in terms of the labor force? Uh, so. oh, very good question. Uh, Exactly. There has been this history, of course, of, of the poor, the, the powerless, the slaves being a drivers of, of economic forces on the farm. Okay. Uh, what happened when, when tractors replaced horses was the sense of freedom, that people could leave the, the, uh, the, the, the shackles of farm work for this life in the city because there were jobs in the city. Uh, and that's the challenge that we have today. Can technology, as they displace workers, then those displaced workers find something else? And notoriously, especially in today's economy, it's been a struggle. That was what got Trump elected, quite frankly, because you had a lot of the economic forces changing in that dynamic. It becomes a real challenge because, and we have this challenge every day on our farm, Labor is, one of, is our biggest expense, right? So what do I do? Try to figure out ways to reduce our cost, more efficient labor, to reduce our prices, because you saw the price of food as it's uh, gone down over the decades and everything, uh, so we could sell our product. Can, would, there's been movements to do like fair trade movements, right, where we want to reward a living wage to workers. And it sort of works, and it sort of doesn't. Because our, you know, if I did a poll of you right now and said, all right, uh, you could buy my peaches at $4 a pound or $8 a pound, but you know I give my workers a much better uh, wage. How many of you would buy the $8 a pound? Good for you. How many of you would buy at $4 a pound? Right. Yeah, probably most of you wouldn't spend twice as much. However, those of you who did raise your hands, that's one of the market's small operations who do attach the story to their food can cater to because you're buying more than just a peach. You're buying that whole story that it represents. So that's a changing force that's occurring, a disruptive force that's occurring. And I don't have a good answer for that, to tell you the truth. Because our workers, you know, we pay them better wages. I'll give you an example. Uh, we started on our farm a bonus program where we gave the workers a bonus at the end of the year. Uh, my daughter, who's fluent in Spanish, I have bad, I'm bad at Spanish, but I could do okay. But she's fluent. She lived in Mexico uh, for a number of years. Uh, so she asked them, what do you call bonus in Spanish? Because we didn't know what to call it. And they looked at me and they, and they looked at my daughter and said, we don't know because we've never gotten a bonus, which tells you the state of the industry where these workers have never received a bonus in their life. You know, so we, were, we felt great that we're giving them a bonus, but felt terrible that these are workers that have worked for decades and have never received a bonus for the work that they do. So when, yeah. when does the first Masumoto peach arrive in the season? What, what, what week or Probably so? Probably about 
third to fourth week in May. We have our first varieties that ripen then. And when would the last variety uh, go to the, market? We, we still farm the old way, where you want variety staggered throughout the season. So from about the third week in May to about the middle of August. So if I went to Buy Right Market, or one mm -hmm. of the few places mm -hmm. where I could get your peaches, would the price vary throughout that season, or would it be pretty consistent? The way we do it, and we're probably silly, is we just keep a flat price. Is that a good idea, <laughs> business school students? <laughs> Shouldn't there be demand pricing like restaurant seating is now? No, I don't know. No, I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's a chance. We, we, I, I do it because I say, you know, I just, this is what I think it's worth. So, and I hope you could sell it at that price. And it, it doesn't, we don't do that much on, on demand. Uh, so we're old fashioned in that sense. But my hope is that everybody in that food system have that, here's the dichotomy we chatted a little bit about. Uh, there's this buzz in the world about disruption, right? Disruptive economies. This is where entrepreneurs are. There's the flip side is I want stability. I want consistency. I think my brokers, my truckers, the, the buyers, they want consistency. And that's the best years I've had is when we all know what the price is and we could all plan around it. We don't get surprises one way or the other. And, and it doesn't bring out the weirdness in people too. Sometimes in a really hot market, you'll, there's a temptation. If prices of peaches suddenly doubled, there's a temptation to pick green peaches because the price is good. It's hard not to do that <laughs> when you go, oh, if I wait another week for that peach to be perfect, the price may collapse. Maybe I'll pick it green and no one will notice. All right. uh, it's, it's part of that human nature, which is part of exactly the work we want to do. We want that human element of it, but we also love consistency at the same time. Moss is a real sage. He reminds me of a, uh, a Taoist saying from the Tao Te Ching, he who knows when enough is enough will always have enough. Yeah, that's what I try to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one, one last question. Um, I was intrigued. You, you made some comment about, like, don't make comments on Yelp. Tell us more. <laughs> one of the challenges of new, new social media is everybody has, like, an equal voice. Used to be in the food system, for example, and you review, okay, I'm a writer, all right? So reviewers of books, you know, used to be they were the gatekeepers. Where you know you had the New York Times, the LA Times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, New York Review of Books. Those were the gatekeepers. And man, if you got a good review, you felt great. Now everybody's a reviewer. So on Amazon, right? I don't read the reviews because one in Amazon, for example, uh, has changed their policy. Because I, one of my books, someone wrote this scathing review saying this is terrible. And I knew the person hadn't read the book. And they actually did research, and they, and they uh, kicked that reviewer off. Because it was someone who just wanted to be an asshole. <laughs> you laugh, but there's a lot of assholes out there. <laughs> you know. Uh, you can and, quote him on that. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, it's the reality of social media. Everybody has a voice. There's a study done uh, by a friend of mine who is, I believe, at UCLA. He looked at. Thai restaurants, and the reviewers on Yelp who reviewed Thai restaurant service, and they tended to be critical of the Asian uh, servers. And if you started scratching deeper, these were racist comments, right? That we didn't quite understand their English when they were telling us the special, right? That it had, the server came out and didn't quite understand the rules of etiquette. These were racist comments that were aimed at those Thai servers in Thai restaurants. But on Yelp, you didn't see that. You just said, service is terrible, waiters are terrible at explaining the food. Right? Or the food came out uneven, you know, they clearly don't, haven't trained their wait staff. Right? But when you scratch deeper, there was another undercurrent going on. You know? So we live in this new transparent system where everyone's a reviewer. You, know, I'm, you don't do reviews of lectures, do you, afterwards? So. <laughs> anyway. To get stars. 
thumbs down. <laughs> well, I mean, it's happening in the academy, right? Where you review your professors. Or your doctor. Yeah, or your doctor. And what does that mean? I, I'm not saying we can't, we should stop it. There's just this shift that's occurring. You know, that's why I like the idea, and this is the optimistic side of me, like the idea that we're all collaborators. You know, you're just not a consumer of my fruit. You are part of my farm. You know, so my hope is that we all collaborate together so we get all work together and we can survive another generation. Thank you for such an inspiring vision. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next week, we have for you, let me just, before you run out of the room, um, Professor Robert Reich will be here next Wednesday. Oh, no kidding. Um, Fantastic. I think he'll be here in between CNN interviews. Um, one of the most important voices now in the political economy, a distinguished professor here at Berkeley. Please read the readings. You'll get a lot more out of the conversation. We've assigned you three chapters of his book, which are all on B courses. And I've also assigned you the first chapter of Phil Howard's book, Concentration and Power in the Food Industry, which will be very interesting to frame the conversation around inequality and stratification of the economy. Have a safe and pleasant evening. Thanks for being here. Yes.